Hi, Charlie. How are you? Great. I'm great. How are you today? I'm great, sir. Thank you uh, for giving me opportunity to interview you for my YouTube channel and podcast. It's my pleasure. My pleasure to be here. So I thought to tell about you and the work that you're doing and also the work that you did before uh, uh, to my, my audience and uh, to in, and also want to introduce you to them. Okay, great. So where do you want to start? So can you please introduce yourself? Sure. Hey, I'm Charlie Isaacs and I work for Salesforce right now. I am a CTO for Customer Connection, which means uh, basically CTO for IoT. I focus on Internet of Things, but I also focus on emerging technology. So emerging technology most recently means things like the metaverse and um, not necessarily cryptocurrency, more focused on digital twins and things pertaining to uh, virtual representations of physical objects. And we could drill into that later if you want. But um, I started at Salesforce around uh, a little over 10 years ago. And I started off in service cloud strategy. We have several clouds now at Salesforce. And um, when I first started, we only had uh, basically sales cloud, which did Salesforce automation. And we were just getting into something called service cloud. And uh, we had a platform, of course, that we're building things on. But um, I focused on service cloud when I first joined Salesforce. So do you want me to talk about uh, what I was doing before that or? Yeah, uh, what what exactly your present role is right now? I'm sorry, could you repeat? You broke up a little bit. Uh, what exactly your present work right now? Oh, what I'm doing right now, okay. So I am, I have, I, I boast that I have the best job at Salesforce. What I do is uh, I'll meet with a customer and they'll tell me uh, their vision for the future. Or um, I'll get a call from someone who's working with one of our customers who's in the process of implementing, or maybe at the early stages of implementation of a Salesforce implementation. And I will uh, help figure out where they should be in anywhere between one and five years. So, uh, we call it the, people normally call that the art of the possible, but I call it the art of the actual because on our Salesforce platform, we can so easily and so rapidly build things, right? Because you don't have to necessarily write code. And by the way, you don't want me to write code, but uh, occasionally I'm on a project right now where I'm having to write code and it's a complete mess, but don't tell anybody I said that. Um, so I'll rapidly prototype things and then, um, hand them off as a vision. But the things that I hand off, um, you wouldn't normally push in, you know, from the, the sandbox or from a staging area into production <laughs> because you don't want uh, what I cobbled together to show a vision. Uh, however, you could take that and harden it on the Salesforce platform and do extensive testing on it and then push it to production. We have customers that have done that. And, and there's some customers that um, I've done that with who are still running um, like an offshoot of, a, of an original prototype that we built. They went through extensive testing on it, hardened it and pushed it to production. And they're still successfully running, running it. And I'm not advising customers to do that. <laughs> Uh, I'm advising them to um, perhaps take a look at the vision we built for them, um, but don't necessarily take what we built verbatim and try to harden that. Uh, anyway, uh, you could do that though on Salesforce. Salesforce is a um, a really cool platform to build on. And uh, I don't know, some examples I, I've been working, the project I'm working on right now is a combination uh, metaverse project. Um, we have a customer that wanted to actually uh, be able to, when a, a customer pops into 
a virtual land like the central land they wanted to be able to sign a guest book and so I worked on that a little bit. So there was some coding involved there because Decentraland has um, a scripting language and you do an HTTP post into our platform. And in this case, it was MuleSoft. We bought a company called MuleSoft, which is an API led approach to integration to other APIs. And I found that it was easier. It's always easier for me to, to leverage MuleSoft whenever I have an API integration to deal with. And in this case, I was going to be integrating from the central land into Salesforce proper, because you, what you want to be able to do is when someone hops into a land, uh, you don't know who that person is, right? They may share their user ID with you, but you still don't know who they are. So the idea is you, you um, have them go over to a little guest book thing where they can sign the guest book if they choose to do it and they sign it and that volunteers their user id and then that pushes that into salesforce and that creates a lead what we call lead right and in salesforce automation a lead ultimately will hope hopefully lead to an opportunity so you go from a lead to an opportunity to a sale and this is going to give that company the ability to to gather information from that uh, person who visited that virtual land and then take another step if they provide their information. Now in the new in the new metaverse, what's gonna happen is, you know, there's no such thing as and they're eliminating cookies and things like that, right? So uh, in the metaverse now, a interaction with the customer is gonna look like, well, if they want to volunteer their information, they'll do that. And you get my user ID, but that doesn't tell you anything about me. It could be my user ID. I'm my name's Charlie. Hi, uh, but my user ID might be Clever Man One Two Three, or you know, um, Don't Let Me Code uh, X Y Z. <laughs> so, um, but when I engage further in that virtual land, let's say I want to buy an NFT, or maybe I want to sign up for a test drive, let's say it's an automotive customer and I want to test drive a vehicle. And, you know, actually we did a prototype where you buy an NFT and that gives you the ability to drop a, a virtual vehicle into the land. You could drive around the, the vehicle in the virtual land, right? So what does that do when you buy the NFT? Well, guess what? I'm going to share my wallet ID, right? I share my wallet ID and that gets stored in Salesforce. So I convert that lead into a sale right there because I'm buying something. I have to spend uh, 0.2 ETH um, to, to buy that NFT. And then I get to drive around that vehicle. Um, so now that company, <clears throat> that, that automotive company knows who I am, especially uh, they know who I am so that they could, they could get me into a real live you know, test drive of a vehicle. So if I test drive a vehicle, um, then maybe I'll buy the vehicle in real life, right? So um, people are thinking about, companies are thinking about now how to uh, engage customers in other worlds. And another example of automotive, since I'm on the automotive industry, another example of interaction in the metaverse would be, this doesn't really sound like the metaverse, but this is a virtual um, interaction. So you go to a showroom, we have a customer who has a connected showroom, right? You go to this automotive, automotive chassis that's sitting in the showroom, and it's not even a car, it's like a chassis. It, they call it a skateboard, right? So it's like a, it's got seats in it and you can sit in it, but then you put the Oculus 2 headset in, or you put the um, any kind of a headset on there and you can see yourself interacting in the vehicle, right? Oh, what does the upholstery look like? And anytime you take a make a change in that virtual vehicle, even though you're sitting in, a, in the vehicle in the skateboard, anytime you make a change, oh, well, what does this color look like on the outside, the exterior color look like with the interior upholstery color? Well, you can configure that and then a remote salesperson 
person running on Salesforce can see all those changes. And, uh, you know, if the user opts in, if they say, hey, yeah, I want to talk to a remote salesperson, um, the remote salesperson can interact with that user and, and, and ask them questions, right? Oh, uh, you know, that beige upholstery um, might look better if it's this texture. Would you like this texture? And they say yes. And they say, okay, here, let me help you. This is the button you push to get that texture in your vehicle. And then um, they build their vehicle in a virtual world and then they can see it represented. They can print it out, right? Um, on a piece of paper, or they can publish it to an NFT and look at it in the in the virtual world. And then they have a virtual representation of what they want. Maybe it's aspir aspirational to them. Maybe that they'll hang that on their wall and they say, you know, one day I'm gonna get this very cool vehicle. I'm gonna have enough money to buy this car, right? I, I can work hard to get this vehicle. Um, so does that make sense? I'm, I'm all over the map here. Um, those are the types of projects I work on and mainly, uh, I do focus on, and they sound boring to some people. Well, I have this, um, oh, I've got it across the room. I could run and get it. Um, but you'll have, you'll be staring at a blank screen. I've got this blood pressure cuff thing. Um, here, hang on just one second. I'll be right back. So this is a medical device. And during the pandemic, I was very, very busy with these medical devices. And, oh, I don't have it charged right now. But anyway, you get the idea. It looks like this. It's got a blood pressure cuff connected to it. And this is the remote patient care, right? So you ship this wrapped up in a box to a patient who you need to monitor because they just had COVID. You sent them home. You say, hey, we're worried about your blood pressure or worried about your body temperature or whatever. So here, here's a device. Uh, hook that up twice a day and we'll keep an eye on you, right? So that has a GSM capability, right? It's got a SIM card basically built into it. And all the, all the patient has to do is, is put the, the thing on, it's got instructions on here that tells them how to do it. And like, so if it's my dad who doesn't, is not very, he's not technology, technology savvy, right? He can read the, in, the directions on here. He pushes the button to power it on. And it sends his blood pressure reading twice a day up to the cloud. And our health cloud application monitors that patient, right? And if there's an anomaly, like a high blood pressure reading, then it will trigger a notification to the nurse. Or if it's a severe problem, it could call 911 or, you know, get the doctor on call or whatever. So my job usually is they'll send me that or they'll say, hey, here is a, um, here are API keys to get into your, um, to our cloud, our IOT cloud, what would this look like connected to Salesforce? So um, in this case, they had this thing called, um, well, they had their own cloud. Uh, they keep changing the name of it, so I'll, I'll leave the name out. But um, all I had to do was say, uh, I can set a threshold rule and say, if threshold was X, then push a notification into our REST API. And every piece of functionality, uh, we have this concept called clicks, not code that I was talking about earlier, right? Where you don't have to write a lot of code. But the other cool thing about Salesforce that makes it really easy to integrate to is that almost every piece of functionality you would ever want to access is API connected. So if you want to send a marketing notification, you can send an API. If you want to do headless commerce, uh, you could use the AP, leverage the API for that. If you want to create a trouble ticket, uh, a case, we call it, in Service Cloud, you could just make an API call. So if there's an anomaly there, that could send a, it 
creates a row basically in what we call a custom object, which is a database table. And it that in turn uh, can call, we have this thing called lightning flow. And lightning flow gives you access to the entire power of Salesforce, including Slack. Um, I don't know if you know this, but Salesforce recently bought Slack. So if there are any Slack customers out there, first of all, let me take a break and thank all of our customers who happen to be li listening to this. Thank you um, for being customers. And uh, I know there, there are a lot of you out there. And if you ever need help with a emer an emerging technology project, uh, contact me. And I'm sure the contact information will be posted somewhere on this call or on the uh, where this is posted. So anyway, to get back to the that Metasante uh, medical device. Um, there's another device that's called the Life Signal Bio Patch that is a patch that they sent me during the COVID shutdown that will has a similar use case, but it uses a different strategy for connecting to the cloud. You need an Android phone, right? Or an iPhone to connect from, it connects via Bluetooth to the cloud. So this Metasante one used a SIM card. So they're different. There's always a, uh, a a different gateway type to get into the cloud, and then once you get into the cloud, whatever the cloud is, you can go directly into Salesforce too. We we frown upon that because we don't want to get flooded with billions of events per minute <laughs> on our Salesforce platform now. However, we we do have some new technology um, called Salesforce Genie that's getting us closer to be able to do that for our customers. Um, we could talk, we could drill down on that if you want to. Um, but we typically see a AWS or a GCP, Google Cloud, right, in between us and the device. And then people do their own rules on top of that. And they say, oh, here, here's an endpoint that you can connect. Another company we bought, which was a great, uh, strategy, a great purchase. By the way, our, and I would love to take credit for all this, but we have these this executive team that's phenomenal that sits a, way above the, the top of the organization, and they make these decisions. But everybody said, "Oh, Slack. Oh, you know, you paid too much. Blah blah blah. Whatever." I'll tell you, I use every use case now has Slack in it. It's become like my interaction operating system. Um, I mean, even like if there's a medical device that has a, um, that's connected to a patient, uh, people can collaborate. You know, you can send that message to Slack just as easily and people collaborate around Slack to, to solve the problem. Oh, who are we going to send to this patient? Oh, well, that person's out of town. Well, you know, uh, what, what workflow should we trigger um, to handle this, this issue? So Slack is very powerful. Not only can you customize the UI, but you can also trigger workflows from Slack. You can also... Uh, push Tableau visualizations into Slack. Slack is just a very cool platform that I, I use for almost all of my um, my customers. So anyway, to mention uh, again back or to refer back to what I was doing during the pandemic and I, how busy I was, people were sending me these medical devices all the time. But now um, as a result of the pandemic, people have really discovered how they can't um, they can't really operate as a business, especially if they have a product, unless they can remotely monitor that product, right? Remember what happened during the pandemic? We all shut down and we couldn't go anywhere. Well, guess what? Um, <laughs> if you're able to monitor all of your, your products, all of your appliances, all of your uh, equipment remotely, then you don't have to send anybody anywhere, right? You can remotely monitor it, check the health of it. You can actually fix it, right? And Tesla did a great job of proving that model out. And it's not like that was a new model. We've been doing that for years. We call them over-the-air updates, right? So you can you can uh, send new software, new new features, new applications to the device just by pushing an over-the-air update to the device. So uh, IoT enables uh, new functionality new business models, and in this case, safer business models, right? Because you're 
you're able to um, do things remotely that you never even dreamed of before. Okay, so I'm kind of going all over the place here. Am I answering part of your question? You wanted to know what I'm doing right now. That's what I'm doing. And again, I have fun every day because every day, I mean, I had like four four customer projects going last week. Um, I've only got like three this week, but, um, and sometimes I'll, I'll get them going and hand them off to somebody. Uh, we have solutions engineers that are able to pick this stuff up um, and run with it. So sometimes I'll get something going and uh, then hand it off. But it's it's really fun when, when new stuff and use cases are all over, like it could be a food processing machine I had last week. And uh, I mentioned there was an automotive project project I'm working on this week. There is a, um, and that I've got a digital twin project where we're taking uh, a building and representing that in a, like it's basically a CAD CAM drawing. And so that's another project I'm working on this week where if an air conditioning unit fails, uh, what's going to be the workflow that's triggered when that air conditioning unit fails, right? So we have that sort of thing. Anyway, I'm talking way too much. Ask some questions. Yeah, it's very interesting. So what do you like most about your job? Oh, I exactly that. Being able to uh, go out, visit, meet with new customers, um, and do the cool new projects. I already mentioned that part of it. But the other part of my job that I really love is we have this thing at Salesforce called the Salesforce Ohana or the Salesforce ecosystem. And these are the most amazing people in the world. Um, and especially there's a group of people on top that sits on top of the ecosystem that we call Salesforce MVPs. And this is a group of people. I'm not even sure what the, the current count is, but um, we have dozens of people uh, maybe hundreds of, no, I don't know how many, do. well, we have, we've got Tableau now and MuleSoft and we've got their MVPs now too. And they call them, uh, what do they call them? Data fam at the, uh, at Tableau and Muleys at MuleSoft. But um, so we've got all, all these, these companies we've acquired too. We've got their MVPs, but these people uh, become MVPs and it's a category of our ecosystem um, they, they become MVPs by helping other people predominantly. They're nominated by their peers. Uh, so, and we have this thing called a uh, trailblazer community, which is like a, a, it's a bulletin board or a community forum where people gather and they ask questions and they get help. Uh, and they go there when they can't find their answer in Trailhead. Trailhead is our training platform. We have a free online training program called Trailhead where anybody in the world can learn about um, Trailhead. And you can even become, and th this is embarrassing because uh, I can't help her very much because I'm busy myself, but she's, um, this is my daughter. My daughter is up on the um, Trailhead site right now because she wants to, um, earn extra money on the side, right? Um, she's a school teacher and she has her summers open. She's thinking, hey, I could be a Salesforce administrator during the summer and make extra money, right? Um, so she's trying to get certified and she's going through all the trailblazer, uh, the trailhead training to do that. So you can ask questions though in this Salesforce trailblazer community itself, the bulletin board. It's like... Um, Oh, what do they call it? Stack Overflow, right? Developers on the call would know it. Uh, or when you Google for an answer uh, to a question, and you could do that too with Salesforce, but it, it'll probably point you to the Trailblazer community for the answer to that question. Um, and we have this thing called Stack Exchange too, where you know people informally answer questions, but. Uh, Typically, they get up on the Trailblazer community and they interact. And there's also, um, anyway, there's an adjunct part of that. It's called the Idea Exchange, and I'll talk about it in a minute. 
But the trailblazer community is very cool because uh, if you answer someone's question and they vote up the answer, um, they they get points. Basically, there's a point system associated with with that. Um, and the more you help someone, uh, the happier you're going to be with that person. And there's someone. There are many people that just nonstop are helping people like Steve Mullis. He's got the most um, answers on on the um, trailblazer community. And he, um, of course, is our number one MVP, but he's an amazing guy and everybody knows him. And there are so many of those folks out here, out there that are helping people. But when I ever I go to an event, so I try to hit some of these Salesforce events and, and you're asking, I'm getting about uh, to your answer in a roundabout way. Uh, the other part, favorite part of my job is interacting with those MVPs and the rest of that um, Ohana. You know, this Ohana means family, by the way, in Hawaiian. Uh, we adopted that name and it truly ap- applies because he's we all act like family. We take care of each other, right? And especially the the MVPs because they're taking care of people that don't know the answer, right? Um, so they are um, at these events and meeting up with them, interacting with all these folks at these what we call dreaming events. And these are these dreaming events are sponsored by not by Salesforce. We don't. You know, sometimes we'll, yeah, well, we donate some money sometimes, right? And say, oh yeah, we'll we'll buy a table or whatever, and we'll we'll show up and and our user experience people will will buy a table and and donate some money to the cause. But um, it's not run by us; it's run by our by the Trailblazer community. So, like Midwest Dreaming is the largest one. I think they have fifteen hundred participants. You know, a lot of people show up for these things. And I was one in Europe. I was in actually two. One was called London's calling. And and there were several hundred people there. I don't know the, the counts, but lots of people show up. We had, um, your dreaming, uh, European dreaming. And that was in, um, Amsterdam. That was amazing because we all got together all the speakers got together on a uh, a boat. We went around the canal. So we just had dinner together. Amazing experience. But interacting with all these people at these dreaming events and um, it, it's just really uh, a fun part of my, about my job. And I, I truly enjoy it. So hopefully that answers your question. Oh, well, okay. So let me, part A of that is also my volunteer work. I, I'm really rewarded by my volunteer work. Um, and I'll meet with uh, underrepresented groups of people. There's a uh, a company, an organization called Pep Up Tech that chooses um, predominantly like African-American people uh, in the United States. Uh, but it's helping people all around the world who wouldn't have uh, normally have a chance to, to learn about technology. Another one is vet force. Vet force helps out the military community all around the world. Anybody who's been in the armed forces is exiting the armed forces and doesn't know what to do. They it's helping these folks get certified on the, on the Salesforce platform. So that's another very rewarding part of my my job is helping out folks in that in those communities. So how does uh, Salesforce is uh, solving problems and helping human beings? Yeah, so that's a great question. Well, I was just speaking at a conference where uh, it was a conference on sustainability, and actually they had a tie-in between sustainability and the metaverse. They said, "How how is the metaverse going to benefit?" You know, and how is technology going to benefit um, sustainability? But, I mean, we have a a multi-prong approach to uh, 
solving the world's problems. We have a one 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 program where one percent of our product, one percent of our people's time, and one percent of our equity uh, is donated. And uh, that's a lot of money. I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars have been donated to nonprofit organizations and charities by by Salesforce. And um, like when I volunteer my time, by the way, we're get, the people's time portion of that is uh, six days a year. I'm paid to take time off to volunteer. So. Um, what is it like 50 hours? I get 50 hours a year to volunteer. And when I donate money to a charity, I can, it can, I get matched. And as I volunteer more time, I go up to different tiers about how much money Salesforce will match me. And for example, uh, I'm at the level where I, if I donate five grand, $5,000, Salesforce will match $5,000. And so that's a lot of money, right? That I and if you multiply that by all the employees we have, that's a lot of money that gets back. Okay, and then we also have uh, when I said product, we give if you're a nonprofit organization, an NGO, um, someone who's not a true business, if you qualify, we will give you ten free Salesforce licenses. And sometimes these companies, that's all they need, right? Because they're, they're small charities and they want to save the whales or they want to plant trees, right? They, those are examples of companies that are on our platform. You could build applications on our platform uh, and leverage those 10 licenses to give back to the world. So there, the 111 is the under, underlying infrastructure of our um, how do we contribute to the world. Mark Benioff, our Currently, our co-CEO, because Brett Taylor is our other CEO, CEO, we have co-CEOs. But when Mark and Parker founded the company, Parker Harris is, is our real CTO. I'm just a fake CTO. I'm a CTO for IoT, basically. Uh, I'm a cloud. They, they grandfathered my title. But but Parker Harris is the real CTO. Uh, amazing, amazing guy. Oh, my gosh. He still has code, I think, running in Salesforce down there. In the, oh, don't tell him I said that. No. Um, Anyway, so they they founded the company um, that they wanted to make sure that they they established this program, right? The one 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 program, and thousands of other companies have adopted the one 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 model now. So, talking about cascading um, uh, goodness going through the world, right? And so, let me focus back on. We really have a uh, an example of donating product also is we built this product called Net Zero Cloud. Actually, that's an example of uh, our sustainability push. So our multi-pronged sustainability push, you know, because I started to talk, answer that question early on, um, is, you know, we have this Net Zero product. We have uh, Mark founded this com company or this organization called One Trillion Trees. We're thinking that if we plant one trillion trees, uh, and everybody can contribute to that, right? Then we can renew, uh, we can offset the carbon that's being uh, generated, right? Trees eat carbon. That's great, and then they give us oxygen. That's perfect. So win-win. We love win-win. So, um, and then we also have a um, an arm, another pillar of our sustainability strategy is um, we have a venture capital arm. It's like a $150 million fund where we'll fund uh, sustainability startups and things like that. So I'm sure I'm forgetting to tell you about that. We have limited time, I know. So I'll cut it off there. But that's that's how I think my vision of how we're giving back to the world. Plus, we're raising up... Um, I guess I, I'm not supposed to use this term anymore, raising people up by the, the bootstraps um, by getting them trained on, on our Salesforce platform. And there's a woman who is, we just had our um, Dreamforce event and a woman, um, Seema, her name's Seema, she stood up and talked about how uh, she was a Ukrainian refugee, a homeless person, and within 
90 days, she was certified on uh, on Salesforce and making great income now um, after being a refugee. So um, helping the, the world a little bit at a time. So you're working on different projects and uh, you're helping uh, 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 different people uh, and uh, 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 with the emergent technologies. So uh, what kind of thoughts that you have about emergent technologies? Yeah, what thoughts do I have? Um, I think for uh, for the younger folks, you know, I'm kind of an older dude, right? Um, although I can still dance. Well, people say I can't dance, but anyway, we'll forget that part about it. Um, for younger people, Technology is always emerging and you should always be learning um, and never stop learning about if you see a piece of new technology coming out, learn about it, even if it's at a cursory level. Um, and adopt and absorb. Don't be afraid to change because the only thing that is remaining consistent, and this is not just for the young people, but uh, even people my age, if you're not learning something new every week, then uh, you're not going to be able to um, really thrive in this world, right? So try to um, embrace change and embrace emerging technology, not just a te technology, things that are emerging, right? Um, and Maybe you're asking specifically about uh, what emerging technology I thought was cool. Um, I I think the coolest part, and, and I'm and I get to work on this too. And I think the coolest part of emerging technology is that finally uh, processing speeds are catching up to where um, digital twinning and things being simulated in the metaverse uh, have become reality. And uh, I did a recent talk on, you know, flight simulator for your business. And I mean, that's nothing new. People, you wouldn't get onto a plane without your pilot being trained in a flight simulator, right? They wouldn't allow you to, the, the pilot has to do a certain number of, of hours of training before they get in a simulator, before they even uh, could get in the cockpit. <clears throat> So why are companies making business decisions without doing what-if scenarios in a simulator, right? So you should be able to, and a factory is a no-brainer uh, example, and they're already doing this in factories where you, you take, um, you have a factory. Yeah, so uh, you as a VP and uh, you as a CTO. So how is this experience uh, uh, telling about new technologies to, uh, to the people and uh, letting them come into the it and uh, trying to adapt to it. Yeah. So are you asking about uh, people that I meet with outside of the company or people that I meet with that are Salesforce employees? Uh, for Salesforce uh, employees, yeah. your customers. Oh, oh, Salesforce internally to Salesforce you're asking about? You're asking about Salesforce employees? No, outside. Oh, outside. outside. Okay. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah. So the way I talk to people about emerging technologies, you know, who are the people who are customers, it it's pretty easy for me to talk to them because usually I've built um, a demo of some sort or I've built a visualization of what I'm trying to explain to them. And the best way to do that is to uh, analyze what that company is doing. You know, we call that, of course, due diligence, right? If you don't do your homework on a company, you're not going to um, be able to speak their language. So the best thing to do is b before you talk to a company, you do as much research as you can. And it's really cool at Salesforce because the account team the people who uh, are with the customer on a day-to-day -day basis do a great job usually of briefing me what their their pain points are, what their needs are, the requirements, what their existing implementation looks like, 
what products they have, um, and in some cases, where they really want to go. And you can find out a lot about a company, uh, and I can find a lot of, about my Salesforce customers, even on the web, right? So you, you look on the web, look on their website, um, and that helps me fill in the gap for what's already been provided to me by our internal account teams. Um, and you can even do things like, if you really want to see where um, the executive team is going uh, for one of our customers, you can look at the um, investor relations briefings, right? Get on their earnings call, right? You can hear about what they're doing, what they've accomplished, and in some cases where they're going in the future, right? So uh, again, at my job, I could take all that information and I can craft a presentation. And in most cases, even craft a demo, uh, leveraging the existing functionality they already have. Okay, this is what you have that's running on Salesforce. This is where we think you should be running on Salesforce and what you can actually accomplish running on Salesforce. And uh, that's the best way to communicate about emerging technologies, right? To show how those emerging technologies will apply directly to their business. So that's why um, I really enjoy what I'm doing because it gives me a chance to, uh, if I don't already know about the emerging technologies, I'm going to learn because I need to show the customer how it could apply to their business. So um, it's funny how, uh, we all have to keep abreast. People who work with me on this, um, we all have to keep abreast of all the emerging technologies in a lot of different vertical fields, right? Like I was mentioning automotive earlier. Well, what's new in automotive? Well, you know, okay, Apple CarPlay is out there in the head unit. Um, the Snapdragon platform is coming, you know, from Quantum, and they've got their own thing. Um, and Harman has their own technology, you know, so there are all these, there are all these platforms and you have to know, if you don't know what all these platforms are, what they do and how they're going to be integrated in the automotive world, for example, then you're not going to look very bright when you're briefing the executives, if you don't know what's going on in their world. So it's a lot of hard work, right? A lot of homework. And then you have to build a demo <laughs> and that makes it even harder. Uh, but again, the easy part is building all this on a Salesforce platform because, um, and then I have people at the, the companies, when I talk to a company, um, the CEO will say, or the C-level executive team, they'll say, uh, they'll go down to their Salesforce admin and they'll say, Hey, you know, this is where, we, this is the vision of where we want to be. And that person will either love me or hate me. <laughs> <laughs> right. But they'll they'll see a cool vision for it's usually they'll really like it a lot. Right. Because that makes their job really interesting because a, a Salesforce admin, their day to day activities are, oh, will you help um, build this little piece of functionality for this uh, business unit over here? But if they can see something that's really cool that's coming on the platform, that makes them more excited about their job. Right. And how um, they're going to be staying at the leading edge by knowing about Salesforce. And that's what I tell people that join our ecosystem. I said, hey, you can either um, do Salesforce 101 every day, you know, just do the basic blocking and tackling, maintaining customers, uh, <laughs> helping reset passwords, you know, uh, changing permissions for a different group and, you know, all the day-to-day -day admin activity. Or you could take your career to wherever you want and the sky's the limit with all this emerging technology that's coming out that integrates into Salesforce. So how are Salesforce is thinking? Uh, how are we thinking or how are we strategizing or how? Well, how Salesforce is thinking? What it want to do? Oh, what, what do we want to do in the future? Well, we want to continue uh, growing, right? We want to um, build, if you look at the numbers from uh, McKinsey, for example, they say that uh, 
we're going to need thousands, tens of thousands of trained Salesforce people in our ecosystem, not just internal employees, uh, but people that are working for our systems integration partners, our independent software vendors, right? Um, our SVs. They, these, um, Salesforce is thinking that we want to grow. We want to be successful, of course, but we also want to um, do well by doing good, right? And again, back to Mark and Brett's philosophy on business, it's Salesforce is the platform, we call it the platform for change. We could change the world on our platform and we want to continue to do that. We want to continue to um, provide success to our customers, but also make the world a more, um, you know, everybody, make everybody successful. Lift all these boats with the rising tide of goodness, right? And uh, I, that's what we're thinking, right? That's that's the strategy of the company. Is and, and when we interview people, um, I mean, try, talk to pick a handful of Salesforce people and find someone that is a jerk. Good luck. Good luck finding a Salesforce. For, well, they probably already left the company, right? They're working for the company. No, um, but we interview people. What's the, one of the first things we ask them is. Um, do you like volunteer work? You know, do you like giving back? Cause you're going to be required, not required. We don't require people to take, you know, seven days or six days off a year, uh, to volunteer. We pay them to do that. Um, they don't have to take the, the time off, but I, when I ask people, when I interview them, I, what's your volunteer, uh, status, right? What do you, what organization do you love volunteering for? Um, what's your passion in that area? And if they can't answer that, they might not be a fit at Salesforce, right? If you don't want to help other people, if you don't want to change the world, if you don't want to make the world a better place, then um, you're probably not going to want to come work for, for us here at Salesforce. So how Salesforce has uh, impacted the planet and uh, uh, impacted uh, the human being's life and uh, and what what exactly the motivation and inspiration and the driving force of the sales force? Yeah, again, it's back to that one 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 program. Um, and I should I should know the statistics off the top of my head. It's like two hundred fifty million dollars in um, donations, part of the one percent of our equity, one uh, percent of our product. You know, tens of thousands of um, companies that are nonprofits are uh, on our platform. Um, we've got the One Trillion Trees orga organization. We've got a whole group um, that's dedicated to sustainability. We've got the Net Zero Cloud. We've got the, we, we just announced um, the Carbon Marketplace Exchange where anybody can get up there and exchange carbon credits. So that was just recently announced a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we've got the net zero cloud. We've got um, everything I mentioned before about the 111 program is our strategy for, for changing the world and for giving back. Um, and our leaders, I mean, it starts at the top again. Um, <laughs> if you go to San Francisco, you'll see um, Benioff Children's Hospital. That's one of our big charities for Dreamforce, right? I think, I forgot the, the number. It's in the tens of billions that, that we raised from Dreamforce for the Benioff Children's uh, Hospital uh, during the concert for kids. Um, and again, I my, uh, my example I gave earlier about giving back, if you multiply that by 65,000 employees or whatever our account is, 70,000 employees. If you have 70,000 employees all giving back, donating money, and they're all volunteering their time, their six days a, a year to charity, 
I mean, that alone is probably doing a lot more than any, anybody out there. Um, it, it's, uh, and the other thing um, I'll leave you with is Mark and Brett at the top of the organization, they don't, and this is going to sound bad and I'm not supposed to be talking about this, but um, it's not about shareholders. I mean, this is, I'm quoting them on this, right? So I guess I can say this. It's about the stakeholders and everybody is a stakeholder. Everybody who's on this planet is a stakeholder. Um and they should benefit from what our what Salesforce does, our platform for change, right? They should benefit in some way from what we do. And sure, our shareholder shareholders will. Um, and again, I'm not supposed to talk about this. Our, our stock is very low, right? Our shareholders are, are probably not that happy right now. But and things are cyclic, right? The whole tech market is down. Um, but what's important is, um, and what our leadership thinks is that if you take care of our stakeholders, then everything else will uh, eventually turn around. So, and I'm very patient in that way. I know that, uh, you know, things go up, things go down, right? So there you go. <clears throat> Uh, I'll put your web links in the description of this video on YouTube. People who find our video on YouTube can see the work that you are doing and can see the contribution that you are doing to the world uh, through the uh, through your medium and through your work. Well, I appreciate you doing that. Thank you so much. I'll also put on the screen as well. They can see it. Okay, great. And it's been really a pleasure talking to you. I really enjoyed our conversation. And thanks for including me. So as a, as a VP and as a CTO, as a person who is into technology for a long time, seeing the evolution of it, uh, you, you talk with people, you solve uh, different uh, problems, you handle different projects. So as, as, a, as a leader, what is your observation about my work? Have you seen any videos of mine on YouTube? Yeah, I have. And um, before, before I agreed to... Um... To join, I, I saw, I looked at a couple of your videos, and uh, hopefully, our video together here is going to be worthy of your work, your previous work. Yes. Yes, it is. So, uh, I myself, I did masters in software engineering and bachelors in computer science and engineering, and uh, right now I'm preparing for AWS. Uh, uh, a DevOps engineer position. So, how talking with experts like you, uh, who already did the pro, uh, who already uh, solved a lot of problems in their life, and uh, who are solving uh, uh, different uh, uh, problems uh, 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 in a higher level, talking with you people, what I'm going to learn and how I'm going to use in my uh, job in coming days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. <clears throat> It's interesting because I went to school um, and got my BS in electrical engineering, right? So I'm a hardware guy. And I did take some computer science courses, but we were using uh, punch cards to uh, on IBM mainframes. And my first job out of college, we were using uh, paper tape readers to load, to bootstrap computers. That's how old I am, okay? Um, but... Sorry. Uh, one thing I learned in school that's very important that I learned to, that I leverage to this day is if you work hard and you keep learning, then you'll be successful. And I wasn't always the smartest student. And as a matter of fact, they told me I shouldn't be an engineer when I first started engineering school. They said, you suck at math. What are you doing in engineering? And I said, well, if I have to learn math to be an engineer, then I'm going to learn math. And my first semester, um, my freshman year in college, I took like four extra math courses just to catch up. That's how bad I was in math. I mean, I was taking basic algebra again in, in my freshman year in college because I just had no desire to learn math.
but I was building on in my spare time. I was building, I was putting chips together to build uh, computers. I built my own computer. I got that part of it, but I didn't understand how math related. I I can speak um, Boolean la- logic in a in a chipset, but I couldn't do um, basic math. Right. So anyway, um, I worked really hard to get uh, to learn math and. I noticed how that applies to my um, everyday work, but you're going to learn stuff in school just to learn it, right? Just because you have to know it and it's not going to be that useful to you in the future. And you can recognize that, but know that you're just um, sometimes you have to go through five different steps to get to the ultimate goal. And just know that you're going through those five different steps to get to that goal. Um, what you're going to learn in in school, hopefully, you should learn how to be creative, because creative creativity is key to engineering. No matter what type of engineering you're doing, there's always a way, and that's how I've always excelled in life. Um, the people, in my opinion, who are successful in engineering, are able to when they run into an obstacle or a roadblock they're able to find a different way to solve the problem, right? There are many w- different ways to solve even a mathematical problem, right? Um, you can get to the answer uh, using many different av- avenues. But my message to young people in in school is don't give up, right? And never think that you can't solve a problem and never let anybody tell you that a problem can't be solved um, if you think you know that you can get to that conclusion and what the answer is. So um, it's just don't, don't let anybody hold you back. Don't let anybody get in your way. Just And that, that applies to problems. That applies to people. There's always going to be some negative person out there that's going to tell you that you can't do something. Oh, Charlie, you don't know math. You're not going to be an engineer, right? Or... Um, no, there's no solution to this problem. Uh, we'll never land a man on the moon. We'll never uh, be able to use reusable rockets, right? I mean, look at, I know Elon Musk is a is a very interesting, per, per, interesting person in many different ways. But, I mean, he doesn't say, no, that's not feasible, right? Who would would have thought we were going to be drilling huge holes in the ground and running cars at high speeds through the ground, right? Um, or reusing rockets and doing having autonomous vehicles uh, orbit the Earth and land on the moon or whatever. I hope uh, even uh, a single word of yours uh, changes one human being who is listening to you from anywhere on this planet, uh, you'll be the reason for their change and you'll be the reason for their growth and you'll be uh, uh, inspiration for them. Well, I would, I would be honored to to, uh, to have that outcome. That would be amazing because uh, I know people have impacted my life. Um, like I, I, I had at least one teacher in, um, in high school, you know, when I was 16 years old or 17 years old that, um, heavily influenced my um, my life by telling me that um, I should I should work in technology right and uh, that one person guided my whole life basically so um, listen to the positive people and you know listen to what the negative people say because they may be giving you be giving you good advice but don't let it stop you Awesome. Uh, can I put this video on my YouTube channel with your permission? Yes, you can. And also, can I put this audio and video clip on my podcast, website, internet, social media, everywhere with your permission? Sure. Okay. Thanks, uh, thanks, Charlie, for your time. No, thank you. I really had fun talking to you. Good luck to you. Awesome. Thank Cheers. you. So Bye. Yeah. Bye.